What is up, beautiful people? Look at this. I'm back in my office. I have the normal background behind me, but it's still not normal because now I'm recording with my iPad. I was recording with my iPhone, and that worked well, but, you know, it's like you use up all your memory, and I can't tell you what I've used my memory up on because it's all under other, and so you got to figure that one out. Anyway, I just thought, well... I can't use my phone to record the video. I'll try using my iPad. May even look better. Who knows? But today we are going to be talking about Enneagram Type 9, and we're going to be looking at the instincts or the subtype of Type 9, the three subtypes of Type 9. And uh, honestly, it's been such a crazy week, you know, with this coronavirus and everything, and also uh, just busy, busy, busy stuff. I got all my notes here, and I haven't uh, gone over these notes uh, today yet. Uh, but I'm just said, if I don't get this done, then I may never get it done. And that's something that I think nines, you guys that are nines, you could learn from right there is just, uh, sometimes and fives as well, want to get it done right. And so that desperation of wanting to get it done right. And that nineness of, well, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to, I want to make sure it's going to be successful. It can keep you from ever taking action. And so you guys that are in the withdrawn category, you know, the fives, fours, and nines, sometimes you have to just get it done. You have to just, I know enough to know enough, let's get it done. And so you got to just move to action. And sometimes you got to be willing to risk, you know, maybe not getting everything said the way you want it to be said in order to just get it said, okay? So let's talk about the nine, the subtypes. And of course, uh, we're going to start with the self-preservation, um, the, yeah, the self-preservation nine, um, and, uh, sometimes called the referee or the advisor. Um, and I've talked about that on my other videos about how this nine can sometimes be like a referee or an advisor. That's a nine eight. And often this, you know, this nine, uh, does to me sound a little bit like a nine eight. Um, but this nine self-preservation nine is called, uh, uh, the appetite nine or the comfort seeking nine or the collector nine um, and I envision this nine wearing work boots okay this is the work boot nine the uh, next nine that we're going to talk about in a second the uh, social nine I think is the dress shoes nine so the dress shoes nine and then the last nine the sexual nine I think of as the sandals nine the guy wearing sandals okay so We'll get to that in a second. So let's go back to the work boots nine, uh, the uh, self-preservation nine. This nine uh, wants uh, what he wants, not always what he needs, and uh, can be satisfied with um, relatively little in terms of comfort, simple pleasures, right? But there's an appetite there that just never seems to be satisfied. Uh, so this nine, you know, it's it's kind of like this nine has decided that well, maybe I won't be loved in this life. Maybe no one will ever really love me for me. So um, I've got to resign myself uh, to not being loved. And instead, I'm going to search for comfort as a compensation for giving up on this need for love. And again, none of that's going to be processed. That's not going to be a conscious thought. But when you dig deep into this nineness and what it means, for this nine, it's kind of like, um, you know, I've just got to accept the fact that life is what it is and people may not really truly ever know me and love me. So I might as well just focus on the concrete, uh, things that are right in front of me that can satisfy me. They can make me comfortable that can sustain me. So, um, this nine, the self-preservation, uh, substitutes comfort and maybe fun and they may be very fun-loving people, but they substitute comfort and fun uh, for what they should be getting in terms of love from other people. They can get stuck in their side tasks uh, and be asleep a little bit to their real needs. One of the questions I ask nines in, um, in uh, coaching is I'll ask them, you know, what is it you need to be doing right now? Because nines tend to put off what they need to be doing in order to do other things that can distract them away from really having to sort through their priorities. By the way, if you're new to my channel, my name is Dr. Tom LeHue, and I do Enneagram videos. You can go to my website. The description is below. 
Uh, or if you want more information, if you want to book a coaching appointment, I do them all week, all around the world through Skype and FaceTime, and even Zoom now sometimes. Uh, you can book appointments, if single appointments, if you just want to work through something specific or coaching plans. Um, all the information is there on my website. And also a couple of courses that I've done and have put up, they're all available there on the website. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, I would encourage you to do that. So you always know when uh, you know new videos, new information comes up. The goal of this channel is just to help you understand yourself and be more compassionate with yourself and to help you understand the people that you love. So let's get back to the nine. This nine is the toughest of the three nines. The self-preservation nine. Well, it makes sense, right? Self-preservation. You're going to preserve yourself, so you're going to be tough. Um, this nine needs uh, specific comforts, but not always good at making those needs known. You know, nines don't always step up and speak up for themselves. And so they may not be very good, at, very clear at making their needs known. Um, just kind of a hopeful expectation that you're going to know what they need. Or that I can take care of my needs independently. So they don't really want to talk about what's going on on the inside of them. Um, and they may not want to share a lot about you know their feelings. They may not even be in touch much with their feelings and their thoughts uh, to be able to express those clearly. But all nines suffer from something like you might call it self-forgetting. Okay, All nines tend to like forget their own needs, their own wants, their own desires, their own dreams. This one does too, although this one has a list of wants, uh, it's kind of substitute wants. It's like instead of being in touch with my real dreams and my real desires of what I want and want to accomplish and being in touch with my own sense of power and voice and identity, since I'm not in touch with those, then I'll be in touch with these other lesser wants, you know, for things for pleasures, for comforts, okay? So this self-forgetting, this going to sleep to yourself, and then this nine, uh, the self-preservation nine, wakes up to, well, what's right around me uh, that, you know, that is comfortable, that, that brings pleasure, that is fun, that feels good. Okay, and so this nine, uh, self-preservation nine, um, can go to sleep to their own sense of being and who they essentially are, and distract themselves from the pain of being disconnected with those deeper desires and those deeper emotions. The self-preservation nine, it, you know, finds a lot of fulfillment in routine activities, uh, everyday satisfaction of appetites, because routines don't require thought. They don't require you to get in touch with your agenda or with your priorities in life. You're able to just kind of move into routines, and uh, that's comforting. Uh, routines can be comfortable, even though they can be destructive. Uh, they can be comfortable because they're familiar and it's what you're used to. Um, the self-preservation nine um, focuses on physical comfort and activities as a way of satisfying uh, their physical needs. They tune out their agendas for life. They tune out their wishes, um, their feelings and are tuned in to immediate experiences and concrete needs. Again, not metaphysical needs. I think the sexual nine is a lot more metaphysical, okay? Meaning ethereal, meaning like in touch with in intuition and being able to pick up on people and what they mean and want. This self-preservation nine is much more gritty, much more down to earth, much more concrete, much more simple, in the sense of what their needs are. Um, they are tuned into the uh, experiences of physical satisfaction, of eating, sleeping, resting, reading, watching TV, playing video games, um, even puzzles. You know, like think like, you know, the puzzles like people do with a, you know, a pencil and a pen, like crossword puzzles or puzzles like people, you know, set them out as pieces, a thousand pieces and they put them together. And one of the reasons I think this nine is the self-preservation nine is really good at solving puzzles. It's not because they're a problem solver like a six, but it's because uh, self-preservation nines are really good at seeing how the various parts fit into the larger context or the whole. So, you know, nines tend to be able to 
uh, be able to understand other people's perspectives, right? So one of those aspects is being able to see how all the various pieces fit together into a whole, into the context, into the larger context. So think like a human resources officer. Like, for example, think maybe Toby Flinderson on The Office, right? Who's a nine. Uh, that person who is able to see this person does this job, this person does that job, and they all work together as pieces of a puzzle to be able to work together to create a larger working sustainable context. Okay, Self-preservation nines are good at seeing how the parts uh, fit into the whole. Um, so good at solving puzzles or at least distracting themselves away from the work they ought to be doing by solving puzzles. Okay, these activities like TV and video games and movies or reading or whatever they're into serve as a way to distract them from their sense of not knowing who I am as a person, what I want, what my agenda is, what my will is, um, or feeling like that might be too aggressive to state that out loud. Remember, there's a difference between being assertive and being aggressive. Assertive is fine. Aggressive, not so fine. Uh, nines tend to feel like if they're assertive that they're being aggressive. Okay, so not being feeling like you're free to be able to state what you want and knowing what you want, then what the self-preservation nine does then is distracts themselves away from that with lesser desires. All right, so they're tuned into the immediate things to do, the routines, the stuff that needs to be done that's right in front of me. You know, I will um, fold all my laundry and put it all away. I'll wash all the dishes and put them all away. I'll give the dog a bath. You know, I'll clean out the garage. The one thing I won't do is get my paperwork in to my graduate school on time so that I don't miss the deadline. That's the one thing I'll put off. And while I put off that big agenda item, I'll stay focused on distracting myself from now that again will not necessarily be a conscious thought. They're not sitting there thinking to themselves, I need to distract myself away from the big task. But uh, unconsciously, that may be very well what they're doing is putting off the big item that needs to be done by focusing their attention on because it seems aggressive maybe to, uh, to believe that I, who am I? To believe that I, you know, could be enrolled in a graduate program. That seems too aggressive. What will people think? People might abandon me, separate from me, and move away from me if they realize, what if I'm not successful? What if I can't accomplish this big dream that I have? Maybe it's just easier to not have those big dreams and just, you know, to settle for these lesser, simpler things. I think I'll just turn on the TV and have a popsicle. Okay. I'm speaking to a few of you guys out there. You all can feel it. So these are very practical people who tend to be a little more irritable and stubborn than the other nines. Did I say the word stubborn? Okay, stubborn. Familiar routine. And stubborn is just a form of anger. Okay, it's a resistance. All right, it's a form of anger. It's a, it's a more passive form of anger. Familiar routines provide structure for self-preservation nines to help them feel more settled in life and more peaceful in life. Routines and structure, um, routines help structure their experience in life in familiar ways that feel safer, okay? When routines are interrupted, um, you know, routines can be all kinds of things from, you know, I, uh, I just ran out of jeans, so what jeans do I buy? Well, you know, a seven's gonna wanna say, let, I haven't looked at jeans in a while. Maybe I should go out and see what kind of jeans are out there. Bring them all up on Amazon. Bring them all up on Walmart.com or Kohl's. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to shop and I'm going to look and I'm going to find what are the trends? What are people wearing? Okay, so a seven's going to look at what 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 am I missing out on? Maybe there's some new changes that have happened in in denim, you know, menswear that I'm not aware of. I need to go out and search and find out what I'm missing. What's a nine's impulse is Levi's fit comfortable. I wear Levi's. Order Levi's. And they'll say, oh, well, they have this new 501. Nope, I don't want that. I want the slim straight. That's what I wear. Levi's. That's what it feels the best. That's what's comfortable. And so do you want to sample some other kind? Nope. I want what I want. That's a routine. Okay. That is a routine. It could be a very good routine. It's just a routine. 
A, a routine can be the way you drive home from work. You know, I go, I turn left at this corner and I turn right at that corner. And then I see the bus stop and I pass the bus stop and then the kids get off the bus. And every day it's the same thing. That can feel very familiar and very comforting about that. And then when somebody calls and says, hey, I need you to stop at the grocery on the way home and pick up something off of your routine, you might see the nine in their stubbornness say, oh, well, I forgot to do that. Okay. Because they don't like necessarily being knocked out of the routine because that's knocked out of my comfort. Okay. So self-preservation nine. Uh, when routines are interrupted or disturbed by others, disturbed, nines don't want to be disturbed, right? Nines can look sometimes friendly, really friendly like a two, uh, but they're not going after the same goal as a two, where a two wants connection, a nine wants to not be disturbed by you. And so friendly can sometimes be to move you away so that you won't invade any more space of mine, okay? Like fives can sometimes do. So when people interrupt or disturb, that's a disturbing word for nines, um, this nine, the self-preservation nine, can get grumpy. Okay. Can I hear an amen? Can get grumpy. May silently retreat away from the relationship in order to resume their activity uh, uninterrupted at a later point. Maybe when, when people aren't around any longer. Um. So they're more okay with being alone than the other nines. Uh, they can be very capable and forceful and hard workers. What did I say? This is the nine with the work boots on. Okay. This is the toughest of the nines. Um, they can often see the context and how pieces fit together to make things work. I already talked about that. If they are pushed or controlled by others, they will dig their heels in and maybe refuse to even move okay so there's that stubborn that brick wall you might get that brick wall from this nine at times uh, you know the only thing that can outlast you know an invading army might be a brick wall so nines can be very resilient in that aspect of just weathering the storm just enduring and persevering through all of the conflict all of the crisis these are you know the people that work a job for 30 years and crisis comes and goes and coalitions come and go and, you know, takeovers and, and principals get fired and teachers get fired. And this one will just stay there for 30 years. Um, often they'll just stay there for 30 years, just resiliently digging their heels in, doing what's expected of them, following their routines, and they can just endure and persevere. It's like their gift to just persevere and endure. Okay, they, they might just refuse to move, but they probably don't want to talk about it. Now, provoked, they might show a little bit of their anger. Anger is something that this nine, the self-preservation nine, needs to get in touch with because they're angry people underneath that surface. They would never see themselves as being angry, right? But anger's there. And if they could sit with that anger for a little bit and call it by name, and that's really the challenge is to call it by name because you probably call it other things like disappointment or or tired, or frustrated, or uh, sleepy, or um, you know, distracted. And, and if you really sit for a second and just think about your life, and say, you know, that that fact that Dad didn't come to my baseball games when I was a kid, and I made all these excuses why Dad, you know, was really trying to be a good dad, but um, um, you know, he had other things he had to do, and. Instead of trying to see his perspective so hard, why don't you just sit with your anger and say, you know what that feeling I have within me is? That's anger. That's disappointment, frustrated, upset, bitter anger is what it is. And if I could quit calling it some other name and quit making excuses and trying to see everybody's perspective, why they said what they said, why they did what they did or didn't do what they did, and I just accept what it is I'm feeling and call it by name, it is anger. And if you could sit with that anger for a moment, it would really help you begin to heal and process that anger. I'm not saying go back and blame everybody that needs to be blamed. I'm just saying if there's anger there, it doesn't do any good to ignore it. It does a lot of good to recognize it, call it by name, and, and say that's what that is. And if this self-preservation nine could get in touch with their anger and sit with it for a little bit, they might realize that when that's over, they could let it go. 
They could just let it go. And it wouldn't have to, you know, sit there in a latent way in which it does. If they could accept it and say, that's what it is. It's anger. I'm angry at my wife. I'm angry at my kids. I'm angry at my father. I'm angry at my coworkers or my boss. They didn't give me a promotion, but you know, that's okay. I've been here for 15 years. And that other person they gave it to who was only here for seven years, who has less education and less experience than me, they probably, I guess, deserved it. I mean, who am I after all? That's anger. That's anger is what that is. Call the demon by its name and say, Look at, don't be afraid to look inside yourself. Okay. This is coming from a seven. Sevens never want to look inside themselves. All right. So listen to me. Look inside yourself, address the truth the way it is, and, and lean on your eight wing and say, I'm going to look at it and look at it for what it is and call it by its name. It's anger. And it's not going to make it worse just because you name it for what it is. And then once you name it for what it is, then you can start to grieve that loss and let it go and move on to a more pleasant, more peaceful, um, more peace loving, which is what you're all about, right? You're the nine, all peace loving. Well, now you can be peaceful because you've let your anger go. All right. So they are good at getting everyone on board to accomplish an objective. They inspire people with humor and have a fun, positive focus to life. Okay, this is the nine that looks like an eight. All right, this is a nine that looks like an eight. I think they could look a little bit like a seven if they distract themselves enough. Okay, because you know, sevens tend to be hedonists and pleasure seekers. This nine could probably hang out with sevens and blend in with sevens and probably be, you know, a little bit of the, the buffer between two sevens, you know. I think this nine would get along with sevens. They could distract themselves with all the kinds of pleasure and whatever's in front of them that feels good you know, that tastes good, that is good. All right, so who are some of these nines? Uh, Self-preservation nines. Well, uh, that's a challenge to always come up with these. And I'm afraid to like just give you a list because I may not be 100%. And then I forget them and it drives me crazy when I forget. Like, for example, when I was talking about the eights, uh, I forgot Carrie Heffernan. Oh man, off of everybody, off of uh, King of Queens. Carrie is an eight wing seven. Uh, and the social eight, okay? And I forgot it. And I was like, oh, how could I forget Carrie, man? I mentioned Deacon, you know, and I forgot Carrie. Okay, so it happens. I forget people all the time. But um, Shrek is probably this nine. Shrek, you know, the big green, uh, what is he? Uh, ogre? He's probably this nine. Um, Harry Potter may well be this nine. Uh, Jim from the office uh, could be uh, the self-preservation nine. I think Pam is also a nine. I know a lot of people think Pam's a two. I think Pam is a nine. I think she is the uh, the next nine, the social nine that looks like a two. The, the social nine looks like a two or like a three. And I think Pam is... A social nine. I think Jim is a self-preservation nine. I think that's why it takes them three seasons to date, right? Because nines are slow at moving to action. Okay. Um, you know, I said that Stanley on The Office was an eight wing nine, the bear. I could be convinced that I could be wrong about that. I could be convinced that Stanley is this nine. If he's a nine, he's this nine, the self-preservation nine, you know, uh, I could be totally convinced that he is this nine wing eight. He could be an eight wing nine. He could be a nine wing eight. I can see it both ways. Um, Doug Heffernan on King of Queens, I think is this self-preservation nine. I'm not sure about Raymond on Everybody Loves Raymond. Um, he could be this nine. I'm not sure. He's a nine. I believe he's a nine, but I'm not sure which nine he is. I think Clint Eastwood is this nine. I think his characters are very relatable to this nine. Uh, I talked about that in another nine video. Sully on Monsters Incorporated is probably this nine, which probably John Goodman, you know, is this nine. And Will Ferrell is probably the self-preservation nine. He looks like a seven, right? And I said this nine could look like an eight and possibly a seven. Uh, but I think if you look at his movies and really examine it, you'll see that he's a character to which things happen to him. Okay, even Elf, he looks very seven-ish, but things are happening to him, okay? 
um, which is characteristic of, of nines. Life happens to a nine. Um, okay, so let's move on to the social nine. The social nine. This is the nine in dress shoes, okay? This is the nine that is uh, called the community benefactor or the participation nine. I love that. The belonging nine. Ooh, that one's going to sting in a minute. Because this self social nine, and I'm going to try and say social throughout this when I'm talking about this nine. The social nine um, wants desperately to be a part of the group. They will serve, give, this is the counter nine, by the way, and uh, they're still lazy in the sense of lazy to their own dreams and their own aspirations and their own identity, but this nine is not lazy, okay? This nine is is maybe a workaholic. This nine is very driven, okay? That's why they're the counter nine. This one is a worker. The last one is a worker too, this one is like a, a worker for the team, all right? For the team. They are going to join a group, and they are going to champion that group, and they are going to try to have the vision for that group and communicate the vision for that group, and they want everybody in the group to understand what the vision of that team is, and they are going to work tirelessly for the goals of that team, all right? Uh, so... The social nine is going to be very focused on working for the good of the team, working to further the goals of the team. And so that's why it's called the participation nine, because it's kind of like, well, I and myself am nobody, but the team is what matters. And I just want to participate with the team. I just want to belong on the team and be a part of the team and help the team and this nine social nine can kind of lose themselves in that team identity all right so they kind of substitute that team identity as their own identity remember all nines forget themselves and so the social nine forgets themselves in the team the team becomes what's important that may be their work their employees that that work for them or uh, the social groups that they belong to. This uh, social nine doesn't want to get um, too involved personally. They want to keep some boundaries between them. Uh, they don't want to be disturbed, like all nines, don't want to be disturbed. Uh, and they, they can look like a three, and they can look like a two. They can look very productive, and they are productive. In health, they're very productive. Uh, but they don't show necessarily the stress that a three shows because they're not motivated by the shame and guilt that a three is motivated by. And they can look like a two, but they don't necessarily need the connections that the two needs. So that's why I mean they don't necessarily want to get too involved, okay? Where a two might get way too involved, uh, a three might get way too involved, the nine is going to keep some distance between them and, and, and everybody, Okay, and themselves. That'll blow your brain. Nines keeping distance between themselves and themselves. Okay, that's kind of the problem is they don't know themselves as well as maybe they should know themselves. They oscillate between being completely available to the team and open to people and then just being absent. Okay, and then just they just disappear and are absent. Uh, they prioritize the group's needs ahead of their own needs. Social nines are um, may have different versions of quote unquote me that are all me, and so there might be the me at work and the me at home and the me, um, you know, at the church and the me at the uh, men's group, um, and they're all me, but they all might be a little bit different versions of quote unquote me because they may they may not really know me, they may not know themselves that well. They tend to merge with the group. Okay, sexual nines merge with an individual, kind of one at a time. This social nine merges with the desires and the wants and the goals of the group. As a way of, that's the part they may not be aware of, distracting themselves from themselves and their own desires, agenda, and goals. Okay, they can be hardworking people, often are, and they often end up in leadership roles. Sometimes drafted into those leadership roles, pushed into those leadership roles. 
They they are very congenial, fun loving, light hearted, sociable. Now that I didn't say any of that over the last nine, did I? I said the last the self preservation nine is hard working, tough, strong minded, capable, hard worker, fun loving, okay, comfort seeking. <clears throat> the social nine is more congenial, more light hearted, more sociable, social nine more cognizant of how they're coming across with other people and careful that they're coming across in a more pleasant put together manner okay can be very fun loving the driving need of the social nine that they may not even be aware of is their need to belong they want to be a part of the group they want to lose themselves in the identity of the group but there's something about this nine that never really feels like they're accepted into the group. So their, ba their, their whole goal and focus is to support the group and be a part of the group and belong to the group and participate with the group. But yet there's something about this connection that never seems to really open the door and let them feel like they really are a part of the group. They're, in other words, they're always striving to be a part of the group. Okay, They never feel like they've made it into the core of that group. They're striving to be a part of the group. Or put it this way, they're always buying a ticket to group admission. Okay, They're always, you no know, threes are always on job interview, right? The nine, the social nine is always purchasing a ticket to group admission but never really feeling like they really belong to the group as much as they desperately want to and as hard as they're working at it there's something that just always feels like they don't really belong to the group and it may simply be because it's not appropriate for you to lose your identity and exchange that for the group's identity you've got to have your own identity you've got to know who you are you can't just distract yourself from yourself. For two people to be in relationship, there's got to be two separate people. And if you don't know yourself, don't understand yourself, and aren't in touch with yourself, and you haven't sat you know, with yourself long enough to know yourself, you can't just blend into the group. You are a separate person, and being a separate person is a good thing. It's okay to be a separate person, to have your own agenda, your own desires, your own abilities, your own talents, your own wishes and dreams and hopes. It's okay. And I think the, the social nine not only has the latent anger underneath the surface, but probably it has some latent sadness, some latent sadness under the surface of as well, of never quite feeling like they belong, never feeling like they really had a seat at the table, maybe even in their own family growing up. They may have been a little bit like Harry Potter, living under the stairs, never really belonging, being an orphan child, you know, that sense of separation, which is at the heart of nineness, is that fear of separation and sort of doing whatever it takes, you know, minimizing your needs, minimizing yourself, minimizing your wants and dreams so that you can belong, so that you can be a part of the group. And I think the social nine, if they sat alone for a minute, they might recognize, oh, that's anger within me, and oh, that's really sadness. L listen, guys, this is coming from a seven, all right? Sevens avoid sadness at all costs. I mean, we want to we want to run away from anything that feels sad, anything that feels you know boring or tedious, or sad or melancholy. And I think the social nine would do well to take some time, maybe an afternoon, maybe longer. To just sit on their front porch step and think back over the memories of their life and say, you know, that really made me sad. It makes me sad that my kids don't have a relationship with me. Or it makes me sad that I lost that job and had to move to another state. Or it makes me sad that I had to let go of that relationship or lose that parent. Um, there's no benefit in minimizing who you are and not feeling those emotions. The benefit comes from sitting with those emotions long enough that you can heal through that pain and then let it go and not just hide it, not just camouflage it, not bury it, but really just process it and let it go. Okay.
This uh, social nine, I think, can be a bit of a human punching bag for people because they will just roll with you know, the struggles and challenges and hardships, and they are so understanding. People can kind of pour out their mess on them, and the nine, the social nine will just sit there and help, and then they move on and leave that social nine to mop up all the mess, you know? So uh, the social nine works very hard to satisfy all the responsibilities uh, that other people have. And again, that can distract you from your own responsibilities, and that's not, that's not a good thing. The social nine does make a good leader because they want the group to win. They don't have that that uh, you know that sharp edge that maybe a three might have of wanting to win themselves. The social nine really just wants the team to win, and that's going to draw people around you to support you. People will want to support you because they know that that you're not inflated with yourself that you're not ate up with yourself, that you want to see the team succeed, and people want to support that and will be good you know, workers around that kind of an environment if you create that kind of environment for them. I got to get a drink. I got to get a drink. Don't worry, it's just Gatorade. Okay. So the uh, social nine can be a bit of a workaholic and, again, may lose themselves and the goals of the work. And again, that makes them the counter nine. Okay. A great deal of effort into supporting the group, the team, while at the same time forgetting and neglecting their own needs. Again, don't just look at what people are running to. Look at what they're running away from. And when you're running to work, running to, you know, whatever committees or groups or organizations you belong to, you're not just running to something. You're running away from something. And it would do well for you to think about what you're running away from. Um, they don't want to share their pain with others. Social nines don't want to burden others with their, they'll take other people's burdens, but they don't want to burden others. And again, can look like a two, right? That's the way twos operate. Twos don't want to burden people with their needs, but they want everybody to tell them what their, what, you know, what my needs are, but they don't want to share their own needs. Social nines can be the same way. They want to support the team. Uh, but if you ask them how they're doing, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. They minimize their own pain. They minimize their own problems, minimize their own desires, wants, and needs for the sake of the group. Kamikaze nines. There we go. Let's call them that. Often they feel deep down that they don't really belong to the group that they are supporting, even when they've given all that they are in support of that group. Uh, their desire, uh, they desire to belong. Uh, they work hard to gain a sense of belonging. Um, they need to get in touch with their sense of not belonging and embrace that feeling, which is not pleasant. They can then begin to focus more of an effort on what do I want? What do I want? What do I need? What do I really desire in my life? What are my priorities and goals? And finally, feel more like they're a part of things when they do that. When they do understand the, themselves and begin to express themselves, wants, needs, desires, wishes, they can really then begin to feel like they're really belonging and not just a caricature of them is belonging, not just an image or a projection of them is belonging. But if you don't really show up, then you're never really going to belong. Okay. Okay. Um, they can be very emotionally stable people who neither go too high or too low. They're not manic. They're not depressive. They tend to be balanced people. They make excellent leaders. They work in support of the team. They don't focus a lot of attention on themselves, even though they're hard workers. They don't need the plaque or the trophy at the end or their name in the certificate or in lights in order to function. They give generously to the groups they support. They're humble and modest and work behind the scenes and can be in can be uh, indecisive and unsure, but they will work tirelessly and unselfishly. Okay, so who are some examples of the social nine? I'm going to guess Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan, who are both presidents, um, are probably social nines. Okay, because being a president has got to be an exhausting job, and you've got to show up, and you've got to work hard, and you've got to believe in what you're doing. You know, and you can't. Um, I'm just going to guess. I'm going to, I'm going to say that Walt Disney is probably this nine, the social nine. And I, and I bet you Mickey Mouse is too. Okay. As a caricature of himself, um, a very productive, very goal oriented, 
very team oriented, you know, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, I think is a nine wing one. And, and I, I think Disney is a nine wing one. I think Fred Rogers is more than likely the social nine. Uh, I already said probably Pam who looks like a two and, uh, you know, probably Winnie the Pooh, you know, Winnie the Pooh's a nine and, uh, he could very well be this nine, just like Walt Disney, you know, just like Mickey Mouse. Okay. Okay. Last nine. The sexual nine, the one-on-one -on -one nine, the union nine, the seeker nine, the nine that shows up in sandals. Why do I say sandals? Well, the first nine, the self-preservation nine, is the nine that shows up in work boots, okay? Hardworking, tough, strong, resilient, a little dusty, a little gritty, okay? The uh, the social nine in dress shoes, going to be president, going to be chairman of the board, right? And uh, going to be productive. And the sexual nine can look like a four at times. The sexual nine loses their identity by merging with other important people in their life, strong people in their life, dominant people in their life. In other words, knowing who I am, that's what I'm not sure of. I can see myself in your eyes. I can see myself when I look through your eyes. And so sexual nines are, in a sense, living their lives through the eyes of someone else or in the eyes of someone else. These nines, more than any other nines, resonate with the concepts of merging and fusing. Okay? Merging and fusing not with a team, but with the strong dominant people in their life. You know, it could be a, an overbearing father. Okay? It could be a very loving, gentle, kind father as well. But the idea is, you know, if I stand up for myself and I make my voice known, dad's going to get upset. Dad might be upset with me. He might withdraw from me. The pain of withdrawal is so strong. I better just see things the way dad does. I better merge with dad, fuse with dad, and then dad will never have a problem with me. Dad won't be upset with me. Dad won't yell at me. Dad will always support me and, you know, be connected to me because if I like what dad likes, then I can always eat with dad. I can always be with dad. And so it's that sense of fear of separation that just drives this sense of, you know, disowning yourself and then with the sexual nine, merging with someone else, their values, their opinions, their views. And I, okay, I think of you guys, the older guys that watched All in the Family, think Edith Bunker, okay? Think Edith Bunker, who's a little ditzy and a little flighty, and she's just going to go along with whatever her dominant husband who i would say is a counterphobic six archie um she tends to just go along with that because it's just easier now there's a stubborn side to edith if you watch the show you know where she kind of independently at times has to buck against that dominant you know presence in her life but the sexual nine um sees themselves through someone else's perspective okay they're not firm on what they want in life. They're not firm on uh, their own agenda. Like all nines, they suffer in that way. But they merge with others to distract themselves away from themselves. Oh, by the way, I had a great quote about the last nine, the social nine. I forgot it. It was, uh, let's see if I can find it. They live very full lives. They're just not full of themselves. Isn't that a great quote for the social nine? They live very full lives. They're just not full of themselves. Okay, back to the sexual nine. Uh, this sexual nine can look like a four because they're on a quest to understand themselves. They want to they want to understand themselves, and they kind of bounce around from person to person, you know, kind of trying to figure out that quest, trying to understand that journey. So they really are on a journey trying to find themselves. So this is the nine that's kind of trying to find themselves. And that can make them at times look like a four. Um, we laugh at Kaylee in our house because this is the kind of nine she is. And she will at times look like a four. You come home and she might have on a dress, an apron, and pearls and be fixing lunch. And you're like, what? She kind of, you know, is going to do things in her own way at times. Um, kind of like searching, you know, for... I like what I like, but I'm not sure what I like, but I'm going to try this and see if that's what I like. Um, and they can look a little bit like a four. Let's just 
in there with that. Okay, they're very sweet, gentle, and kind people. Boy, gentle, I think, is the word. Gentle. They, uh, they kind of attract and withdraw. Okay, they're kind of in and they're kind of out, which fours do that, don't they? They kind of push-pull. Um, they're not necessarily, the, so, the sexual nine is not necessarily connected with their own passion for living and for life. They're the much, they're very much the least assertive of the nines. All right. So if you think in terms of assertive, like you you should put the self-preservation -preser nine as the most assertive, the social nine as midline, you know, will stand up for the team and will show up for the team. And then the sexual nine is going to be the least assertive, the most mild mannered, the most gentle, the most mindful. Okay. The most intuitive, the most able to read people and pick up on people's signals that's underlying beneath the surface, okay? The most metaphysical, ethereal, all right, probably artistic, maybe moving in terms of art like music and poetry and painting and those kinds of things. They're going to be more comfortable with that world, the, 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 the nine and sandals, okay? Looking for a sense of purpose. Um, they can't seem to locate that sense of purpose or locate or be able to verbalize what their message in life is. And so since they can't locate that unconsciously, they kind of take on the opinions, attitudes, beliefs, values, wants, desires of other people and could then be easily manipulated. That's something to you might want to develop some boundaries so that you're not manipulated. Um, they'll take on the important feelings and opinions of the people in their life. I'm sorry, I said that too fast. The the opinions and feelings and views of the important people in their lives. Okay. Um, they may lose the difference between their own and the people that they love. And they tend to blend together with other people. When they don't know what they want, need, feel, or think, they have a hard time expressing that they don't know what they want, think, or need, or feel to other people. Especially if what they do want differs from someone else. Now, if I'm committed to not causing conflict, but I want what I want, um, and it's different from what you want, I either will not express that, or I might be dishonest. And nines can sometimes look dishonest because they really may not be open. They may not be trying to lie, but they may not necessarily be openly expressing their wants and desires for fear that it's going to create or generate conflict in the relationship. So they may go beneath the surface and kind of secretly, stubbornly carry out their desires in a way that doesn't create more conflict. But then when you discover that they've been doing that, of course, then there's going to be conflict. And you will say they're sneaky. And nines, particularly the sexual nine, might look a little sneaky when really they're just, I think, trying to do what they want to do without creating conflict. And the fact that they know what they want to do, or at least are experimenting with what they think they might want to do, is something that really we ought to applaud in them. Don't applaud, don't applaud sneakiness, but if we can see the good and the bad is, hey, at least they are trying to exercise some kind of agenda on their own, and that's a good move for a nine. I'm sorry that they feel like they have to do it, you know, without my knowing it. Um, okay, let's see. They have a hard time expressing their desires to others if they are in touch with them. Um, they're not consciously aware of the boundaries that other people ex have. So they may tend to like move in too close and not really respect people's boundaries or have a strong enough boundaries for themselves, even knowing what's appropriate, you know, between people. Uh, they can rely heavily on others for support. They can take refuge in close relationships with other people uh, because they want to avoid that separation feeling within themselves. They look to others to satisfy their sense of who they are and their identity and help them overcome their sense of loneliness, abandonment, and purposelessness. That's deep stuff. The most emotional of the nines is the sexual nine. They may not realize how much they've merged with another person until something happens and there's a physical boundary, a geographical boundary. 
And when that geographical or physical boundary happens, they may realize that they've merged with someone that's not very helpful for them. Let me give you an example. Suppose you, uh, a sexual nine in your life has a friend that is not a healthy friend for them, that tends to be a pessimistic troublemaker. That sexual nine may not see all the flaws and they may start to become like them, dress like them, laugh at what they're laughing at. Um, you know, and maybe going in all kinds of ways inappropriate. And then perhaps that friend of theirs goes away for summer camp for two months or three months is gone. And there's a now a forced geographical boundary that separates the sexual nine from that unpleasant, unattractive friend. Okay. That gives a time of separation for this sexual nine to sort of get back in touch with themselves and determine that, you know, some of these th music I'm listening to and some of these words I'm saying, perhaps, or some of these clothing that I'm wearing, I'm not really, I don't really like this. I'm not really, this really isn't me. I'm not really comfortable with this. And so they discard that clothing and discard that music and discard those words and they no longer, you know, and they go back to quote unquote their normal self, right? That wouldn't have happened maybe if there hadn't have been a forced geographical separation. Now, again, what's going to happen is probably they're going to align themselves with somebody else. And so then they'll adopt a new style and a new way of seeing things and again that's why i think this nine can sometimes social nine sexual nine can sometimes look like a four because it's kind of like they're trying on personalities which is something that young fours often do until they feel like they've arrived at their unique special personality so a sexual nine can end up in a relationship with somebody that is not beneficial to them but they may not see how unbeneficial it is until a forced geographical separation happens and then it gives space for this sexual nine to sort of look internally and say i don't even like this why am i wearing this i don't even like this and they can dis discard it now and sort of go back to quote unquote themselves which again is kind of what they're searching for themselves okay wow wow where are we um, this sexual nine has a strong intuition about others and can sense what other people need. <coughs> they can empathize with people deeply without ever becoming too involved. So counselors, maybe very good counselors, because they can sort of intuitively know what people need and what steps those people need to take without necessarily getting entangled. Um, even though they are the blending type, you know, it, it's... People are complex, man. People are complex. One thing I'm learning from the Enneagram is people are not simple. They're complex. Whew, where are we? Um, they have a strong ability to listen and to empathize with people and to gain people's perspectives and see people's perspectives. A tendency to be indecisive and insecure. Um, they can even know what they want, but not necessarily carry it out. Or feels like too aggressive to take it to action. When they begin to assert who they are as a unique individual, they can be very caring and dedicated and, pers uh, and personal uh, with a lot of creativity. Again, I think that sexual four is going to look more creative. Look a little bit more creative. Um, they are very humble in their work and very gentle in their work. Um, when they work through their fears of acting independently and being their own person, they're able, and the fear of expressing their own authority. Standing in their own shoes, you might say. Sandals. Uh, they can be thoughtful, sensitive leaders who are good with people and good at helping people. The more they work to discover their own identity, that is, their wants, desires, wishes, strengths, opinions, values, beliefs, the more they can center in on what is important to them and really hold that and believe that, um, the more present they can be to life the more they can fully show up in life. And the more they will do their creative, gentle, caring, compassionate work with their own unique stamp on it. That's a good way to say it. So they may be very simple, may, may be very sensitive to others. Um, 
and they're always kind of thinking, what must I do to stay remain connected? Afraid of looking inside themselves that there might be no purpose and no identity? There is. There is a purpose. There is an identity. Okay? Don't be afraid to look inside. Don't be afraid to sit there for a moment and, and question yourself. Don't be afraid of openness and honesty. That's one of the things that nines struggle with, and it starts with being open and honest with yourself. Okay? They def want to defend against the separation by having no boundaries. I am... I am who I am when I am with others. No, you are who you are. Okay, you need to figure out who you are is and then embrace that and then, you know, stand on your own two feet. You need help with that? Make an appointment, coaching appointment, okay? I work with a lot of nines who struggle with these kinds of questions and we, we can help, okay? We can help. All right, so who are some nines that fit the sexual nine? Uh, again, I come back to John Denver who sings words like, come let me look in your eyes, you know, so I can find myself in your eyes. Um, John Denver's probably a gentle, think sandals. Would he look good in sandals? Okay, it's probably a sexual nine. Bob Ross, gentle. Mr. Rogers could be, okay, could be. Um, again, some of these are hard to nail down without, you know, from just observing through television and that. Some of them are a little harder to nail down. But gentle, Fred Rogers is very gentle. He could be this nine. Bob Ross, the painter, very gentle. I mean, extremely gentle. And fuses with a forest, okay? John Denver fuses with a forest. He merges with a forest, okay? He merges with the Rocky Mountain High, with uh, Grandma's Feather Bed, with, hey, it's good to be back home again, you know? Hey, it's good to have a a, 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 a fiddle and a and a... Uh, a waffle griddle, and thank God I'm a country boy, right? Is that his identity? John Duchendorf? That's his real name. I'll just adopt. You know, he literally walked into a recording studio or whatever, looked up, saw a picture of Denver, never been there. And he said, that looks good. And they changed his name to John Denver. Okay, that's nine energy right there. My last name doesn't matter. Duchendorf doesn't matter. It's too hard for people to pronounce. People are going to wonder where I'm from. Give me the name Denver. That's fine. I'll wear that name. Never been there, but I'm sure it's pretty. That's nine stuff. Don't lose yourself, guys. Come back to yourself, okay? Ask yourself the tough questions. Be, don't be afraid to sit with anger and sadness and loneliness, and uh, recognize, you know, that some people will separate from you, from you if you are yourself. But if they do, then maybe you don't really need those people in your life anyway. It's okay if other people separate from you. Just don't you separate from you. All right. Be present to life. Whoa. Be present. That means show up. You show up. Not some form of you. Not some caricature of you. Not some new name that people can spell better of you, but you show up to life. Thank you guys. I'll see you next time.